Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to the October edition of One Month to a More Effective Compliance Program. This is the only monthly compliance program focusing on a different subject, taking a deep dive so that it will help you have a more effective compliance program. This month, I will be talking about One Month to More Effective Compliance for Business Ventures. But first, a word from this month's sponsor, the Volkoff Law Group. Hi, I'm Mike Volkoff of the Volkoff Law Group and proud sponsor of this month's podcast series. The Volkoff Law Group believes that every company should have a robust ethics and compliance program. Experience and research show that ethical companies are better performers in the global marketplace. At ethical companies, employees believe in the company, they feel vested in the company, and are more productive. As a result, misconduct rates are much lower and financial performance is higher. We can help you achieve these benefits through an effective ethics and compliance program. The Volkoff Law Group specializes in corporate compliance, internal investigations, and white-collar defense. We are your partners in our joint mission of building an effective ethical culture for your company. Our 10 years experience shows that business cultures can change. We are committed to work with you to achieve an ethical culture in your company. We address your company's anti-corruption, antitrust, trade and sanctions, anti-money laundering, and other regulatory and legal risks. We do this through practical guidance that your company can easily implement. You can learn more about our commitment to effective ethics and compliance programs at our website, www.volkofflaw.com, our award-winning blog, Corruption, Crime, and Compliance, and our new podcast series of the same name. You can contact me at my email address, mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com. Let us know how we can help you achieve your goals. Thank you, Michael. In this month's series, we will take a look at the role of compliance in mergers and acquisitions, the role of compliance in joint ventures and joint venture agreements, distributorships, franchises, teaming agreements, partnerships, as well as other types of business relationships. At the end of October, you have an excellent grounding in what you need to do for a business venture under the FCPA. My one-month series of One Month to a More Effective Compliance Program running through 2017 is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Day 7, Evaluation of Pre-Acquisition Risk Factors. Today I want to take a look at what you should do with the information that you obtain in your pre-acquisition due diligence. Jay Martin, Chief Compliance Officer at Baker Hughes, a GE company, has suggested that an approach that reviews key risk factors to move forward. He's developed uh, a list of 15 risk factors for a FCPA compliance analysis. It prompts a purchaser to conduct extra uh, careful or heightened due diligence or even consider moving forward with an acquisition under extreme circumstances. So what are Martin's 15 different issues? Well, number one, a presence of the target in countries whose corruption is uh, perceived to be high, obviously under the TI-CPI. Two, participation in an industry that has been the subject of recent or ongoing FCPA investigations or enforcement actions, such as the energy space, telecoms, pharmaceuticals, or any other sector that the uh, DOJ has swept through. Three, Significant use of third-party agents or in sales representatives, consultants, distributors, subcontractors, or in logistics personnel. Four, significant contracts with foreign government governments or state-owned enterprises or state-controlled entities. Five, substantial revenue from a foreign government or state-owned enterprise or a state-controlled entity. Six, substantial projected revenue growth in a foreign country. How are you going to get that growth? Seven, high amount or frequency of claim discounts, rebates, or refunds in a foreign country. Eight, substantial system of regulatory approval required 
for example, licenses and permits in the country in the business you're in. Nine, a history of prior and a bribery or FCPA investigations or prosecutions or enforcement actions. Ten, very poor or no compliance or FCPA compliance training. Eleven, a weak corporate culture, compliance program, or ethical mission. And particularly from legal sales and finance perspective at the parent level or in foreign company operations, foreign country operations, excuse me. Twelve, significant issues in the past from compliance audits, for example, excessive undocumented entertainment of foreign government officials. Thirteen, and this is one you may not think of, the degree of competition in a foreign country. Is it high or is it low? Fourteen, weak internal controls at the parent or in the foreign country operations. And 15, an in-country manager who appears indifferent or uncommitted to U.S. laws such as the FCPA or indeed anti-corruption laws from other countries. In evaluating answers to the above inquiries or those you develop on your own, you may need, you, you will also need to consider some sort of risk rating or ranking to determine the amount of risk your company is willing to accept, but also so uh, you can as- properly assess the risk. I advocate a force risk ranking, which is that risk should be initially identified then plotted on a heat map to determine their priority. Uh, most significant is the greatest risk with the greatest likelihood of occurring, and that's a priority risk, and that should become the focus of your post-acquisition remediation plan going forward. And in today's text, I lay out a chart which I show this. So we have likelihood rating one through five, your assessment, and then your evaluation criteria. Likelihood factors should include the existence of controls, written policies designed to mitigate risk capable of leadership to recognize and prevent a compliance program. Compliance failures or near misses, training and program awareness. A product of likelihood and significant risk reflects the significance of a particular risk universe. It's not a measure of compliance effectiveness. The key to such approach is, however, the action taken by the steps. Or if you look at it from the Wei Chen perspective, what's your data, then how did you loop that data back in and a feedback to move forward? This is another way of saying your pre-acquisition risk assessment informs your post-acquisition remedial actions to the target companies. This is the method that's set forth in the 2012 FCPA guidance. The Department of Justice wants you to take a reasoned approach or operationalize your compliance program. It's also important that after your pre-acquisition due diligence is completed and the transaction moves forward, the acquiring company should attempt to protect itself through the most robust contractual provisions it can obtain, including indemnification against possible FCPA violations, including both payments of all investigative costs and assessed penalties. An acquiring company should also obtain reps and warranties in the final sales agreement that the entire company uses for participation in the transaction as permitted under local law. That there is an absence of government owners in the company and the target company has made no corrupt payments to foreign officials. Lastly, there should be a rep that all books and records presented to the acquiring company for review, for review were complete and accurate. To emphasize all of the above, the Department of Justice stated in the Pfizer Deferred Prosecution Agreement that in the mergers and acquisitions context, a company is to ensure that when practical and appropriate on the basis of an SCPA risk assessment, new business entities are only acquired after a thorough risk-based FCPA anti-corruption due diligence uh, is conducted by a suitable combination of legal compliance and accounting personnel. When such due diligence is appropriate but not practical prior to acquisition of a new business for reasons beyond a company's control or due to uh, applicable law, the acquiring company should continue to conduct anti-corruption due diligence subsequent to the acquisition and report to the DOJ any corrupt payments. So what are today's three key takeaways? Number one. Create, create your own list of key risk factors in your own for your own protocol. 
obviously this will be something that will be developed based upon the risk that your company is willing to accept, but you need to develop your own key risk factors. Two, you need to have a risk ranking of the risk factors and uh, characterize those by a force nature. And then three, just remember the words of the Department of Justice from the Pfizer DPA. That's a company, they want to see companies only acquire new businesses after thorough risk-based FCPA and anti-corruption due diligence. So focus on your pre-acquisition due diligence. I recognize that time constraints and perhaps even legal constraints may lead you to have a, a less than uh, less due diligence than you would like to. So consider this moving forward. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed day seven of one month to more effective compliance for business ventures. And I hope you will join me tomorrow for day eight. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of One Month to More Effective Compliance for Business Ventures, and I hope you will join me again. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate the podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about the only daily podcast which will bring you a more effective compliance program. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Once again, thanks to this month's sponsor, Mike Volkoff at the Volkoff Law Group. The <clears throat> podcast series, One Month to a More Effective Compliance Program, is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Please join us again.